How old are you? 18. Take off some of those clothes. Show the Cobra fans what they really want to see. They are gonna love you. This is just the beginning for you. I can pay you so much more if you're willing to go all the way. Introducing Brent Korg. It's fun to play with who we are, don't you think? Okay. You heard of this guy, Brent Corrigan? His videos are selling like hotcakes. Just wait till I make you a star. Steven, it's Joe. Viper Boys. Who? Listen, we're big fans, and we're gonna use Brent in a little thing, so... Uh... Nobody works with Brent. He's mine. Hello? Mother... You gotta spend money to make money. I am willing to give you $25,000 for one video. I'm not losing you to anybody. You can't stop me from using my name. I trademarked it. Oh, they want to cause the shots around here. You're Brent Corrigan. You have to do this video. If Steven is the only one standing in your way, then we'll take care of it. We'll make the movie and be rich. And you're going to be a good boy, right? No little bitches! No little bitches! Oh my god, you are doing porn! Maybe I like it. Maybe you pissed off the wrong person. Give it your best shot, you little shit. He's a kid. You got me into this! Do a little bitch! No, no! I've never done this before. I'll show you how. How was I? You are gonna be a big star. King Cobra! Let's talk about this movie. This movie is a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of Thank really you. dark. It's darkly fun. hilarious. Darkly hilarious. And, and, but I think also darkly tragic at the same time. I mean, specifically for your character, not just because of his what happens to him, but also his entire personality and the way that he lives his life and how he sort of can't confront his own sort of exploitation uh, within this company. What drew you to this, to this role? Uh, well, let's see, I had worked with uh, James Franco before on a, another film that he was producing called The Adderall Diaries, and we got along very well, and we were looking for something else to do together, and you know, he always has uh, tons of ideas, and, and um, he sent this to me, and I, I read it, and um, yeah, I was really surprised. I, I, I really loved the character and, and uh, was thrilled. I mean, it was a very rich and, and flushed out character and, and uh, I loved the whole journey of it. And then at the same time, I also had great fear and anxiety about actually doing it. <laughs> um, but then I met with Justin and uh, talked to him about it. And, and uh, you know, of course, we talked about the sexual aspects of it and the subject matter. And he shared with me that James would be doing the lion's share of a lot of that stuff. And I think it was, it was brilliant direction because it made me immediately, it, it sort of tapped into my competitive nature. And I was like, no, 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 I, I don't want him to do everything. You know? <laughs> You're like, I can do it too. Yeah, I can do it too. Yeah, I'm an actor. I want to I wanna participate. And um, yeah, so that's what we ended up doing. And Justin, it's, it's uh, based on a true story. I'm not sure if it's loosely based or if it's you know, directly based on the, on the true story. How did you hear about the story of Brent Corrigan and, and everything that had happened? Uh, I read about it while researching uh, my first film, I Am Michael, actually. And it always stuck with me because it's just such an insane story. Uh, you know, kind of suburban gay pornographer murdered over a star's contract, enough to raise a few eyebrows. Right. But the more I read about each character, uh, the more I kind of just found that it was, you know, a story much bigger than sex and porn and murder. It was these kind of four very unique, interesting characters kind of trying to, you know, find their place in this world. And uh, I thought it'd make for a really cool, different kind of movie. When did you find the, the tone of the film? Because I think a lot of different filmmakers would approach it a different way, or they would try to approach it one way and it would come out, but you have a very distinct approach to, to, to this story. <laughs> yeah, I think that with, you know, earlier drafts of the script were a little bit more dramatic, but just the nature of the story and these wild characters, you know, Joe and Harlow, played by uh, Franco and Alan, are these sort of uh, these gay escorts turned 
pornographers. We have, uh, you know... You're also hilariously, <laughs> not to say anything bad about the, the characters, because I'm sure you're committed, hilariously dumb at times as well. Yes, yeah, not, not, not the smartest, but, uh, <laughs> but they're pretty, so that's fine. Uh, you know. Driven and motivated by, uh, yeah, Dodge <laughs> Vipers and yeah, all kinds of errant exactly. nonsense. Yeah. They love sound like parents making cars. excuses for them. Yeah, like, know, but they're I driven know. and motivated and they're pretty. <laughs> like, they're okay. That's right. <laughs> exactly. But you know what? Those still characters... love them. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Still, they're, yeah, nobody's better. <laughs> it just kind of made more sense and the film became more interesting and kind of worked better script-wise and then also, you know, on set kind of improv-wise when we had more fun with it. You know, so... Um, yeah, the kind of first reviews that, 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 used, that said dark comedy, I was a little bit taken aback at first, and then I thought, well, mm -hmm. that's fine. Yeah. It's darkly comedic. Absolutely, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're right. I mean, these, these two guys, you know, I mean, with, with the plan that they had and what they were driven by and, and their motivation and how they went about trying to, as tragic as it was, it was inanely silly. I mean, even the, the true story and, and what these guys actually did and how the FBI were actually able to track them. I mean, they didn't... They didn't think this through no. very well. I mean, they thought they could just take care of me and that would be it and they could go on with their lives and everything would be fine. So it was a, a pretty insane, not very well thought out plan for sure. Yeah. Your character, while he's sort of running a successful porn company, I mean, yeah. we see what it takes to run a successful por porn company. It's a guy with a video camera and, like, <laughs> <laughs> and he right. can burn and his an uplink. Or, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, but at the same time, while, while running this and, and finding and casting people, He's also closeted, and he's struggling with his own identity. Where did that come from? What made you bring that to the character? And how, what was that like for you? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that was certainly something that I, I thought was uh, intriguing and, and uh, painful uh, for the character. Uh, you know, Molly Ringwald plays my sister in, in this, and, and uh, we have that scene where she's trying to get me to go out on a date with this woman. And I mean, so clearly, I mean, this guy has been closeted his whole life. Even the people closest to him don't know uh, what he's been up to sort of behind closed doors. Um, so, yeah, so that just really made my heart go out to the guy. I mean, the, the struggle and living with the shame and the guilt and what it was like at that particular time period and, you know, two thousand not that long ago, you know, but... Uh, what, what's the exact year that it takes place again? 2007, 2006. Yeah, the murder was 2007 and the story starts around 2004 or five. Yeah. Which is very, I mean, we can easily say that in 2004, 2005, it was a completely different world in terms of the yeah. way the LGBTQ community was perceived. Phenomenally, right? I mean, yeah. that's one of the beautiful things, just getting to be a part of a project like this, is to see that, look, over the last 10, you know, 8, 10 years, I mean, things have certainly progressed. I mean, there's obviously further to go, and, uh, you know, we still have a lot more to learn, and, and uh, you know, but the fact that, you know, judgment has settled down. I mean, there has been a lot more acceptance, thank God. Right. I mean, there's the possibility that your character, if the film took place now, it'd, it'd almost be harder to believe that he was closeted because it's so much more of a progressive world. That's not to say yeah. that there aren't people in the closet, but sure. you know, it's something that you would kind of question, why is he still in the closet here? Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. His sister would probably even be like, hey, we get it. Yeah, right. Set you up with a guy. Come on it's out. Okay. Yeah, well, you know? yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you worked with James Franco on your last film, I Am Michael, as well. He's a producer on that, and he was as well as in it. And the same thing goes with this. Um, how did you start working with James? The initial connection was was actually through Gus Van Sant. Uh, I had been an assistant on Milk, and around that time, I was you know I graduated film school, was making short films and music videos and writing scripts. And uh, he watched a short film of mine, my thesis film, passed it to James, and that's how I ended up on I Am Michael. And uh, probably about a couple months after Sundance, where I saw you, James, since he likes to uh, you know, create a lot of content, was sort of kind of, you know, give me a little nudge. You know, what are we doing next? What do you have? And I kind of threw this out there thinking, I don't know if we could make it. It's about gay porn. And I feel like it's, <laughs> I don't know who will be in it and who will finance it. And it actually came together very, very quickly within a matter of months. So uh, I think we just kind of, you know, hit some magical moment in time where people were ready for a wild film like this. You think it's a, do you feel like it's a wild film? I think it's pretty wild. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Christian, what about you? Do you feel like you're at a point in your career, and I ask this of people who have sort of like, you know, when you were young, you had this sort of movie star phase, and now you have this great show, Mr. Robot. Do you feel like you are in a phase where you can take a lot more chances? Like a film like this doesn't sort of scare you off as much at, at all? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I do feel that uh, I'm at this point where I do want to find things that, you know, scare me a little bit and, and do them anyway, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I am enjoying uh, that that freedom to get those opportunities. And uh, and you didn't have one of the more uh, transgressive parts of the movie, but you were in Nympho, Nymphomaniac, which is a yeah. wildly fun transgressive movie. <laughs> yeah, no, that was something I was uh, extraordinarily... And Willem Dafoe was in that, yeah, yeah. as well. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I... Working with Lars von Trier, I mean, that did sort of... Uh, that was definitely a, a turning point for me, just... Uh, as far as you know, working with directors and and uh, looking for interesting material, and and also getting the opportunity to play a character that people wouldn't necessarily have seen me doing, so um, so that just sort of put that in my head, and and since then, that's sort of the direction that I've been trying to move in. Is there an element of like uh, at this point in your career, if you sort of look at something like King Cobra, and a manager or an agent said to you like? I don't know if you should do this. It could be pretty bad for your career. Yeah. Are you kind of like, my career is my career. Like, I've had it now for 25 years. Yeah. Like, I think I'll be okay. Right, right, right. Uh, you know, I just, I listen to my wife, really. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's all I do. And what did she say about King Cobra? Oh, she's like, yeah, you have to do this. Yeah, I mean, she read it and, and, um, and, you know, yeah, she thought it was uh, something that I should definitely not be afraid to do. And, and uh, so, so I dove in full throttle. I, I owe her uh, drinks and dinner. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. Yeah. They've never met, actually. Yeah. I mean, we've worked together for a year now, and, and uh, he doesn't believe that she actually exists. So <laughs> Thursday, she will show up at the screening. Yeah. Uh, Justin, with I Am Michael and with King Cobra, uh, as an LGBT filmmaker, not to categorize you at all, you're sort of definitely interested in the non-inspirational side of LGBTQ filmmaking, which that in itself is somewhat... I think subversive, or at least at least different. Um, do you do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about sort of the stories that you're telling of the LGBT community and how it represents it? I mean, I'm of the opinion personally that one story is not monolithic in terms of representation. Exactly. Yeah. No, I've definitely you know thought about it and had to talk about it a lot. And uh, I, I kind of just think about the you know my influences from when I was in high school would have been you know, early Gus Van Sant films like Mala Noche or Todd Haynes Poison. You know, a lot of kind of queer filmmakers best. that were... What was that? The best. Yes, yes. And they'd always, always kind of say, uh, you know, we should be unapologetic about, you know, telling queer stories. So not making them just to please a straight audience and mm -hmm. honestly, like, not worrying about representation because it's, to me, it's less progressive to, you know, start to write a script and think, oh, I shouldn't have a character that's a gay porn star because people might think that all gay people are porn stars. Well, I just don't think that's, <laughs> that's going to happen. Uh, so, um, yeah, I feel, I feel like it's, you know, important to tell a lot of different kinds of gay stories, not just the uplifting ones. But these, you know, I'm Michael and King Cobra, uh, I would like to think they're well-rounded characters. And so it's not just like these caricatures and, you know, poking fun at, a, you know, at gay people who might be porn stars or murderers or ex-gays. You know, it's kind of like really trying to understand who these people are. Yeah, I mean, it's like you could set this story against any kind of backdrop. At the end of the day, it's, you know, a story about obsession and greed and you know, power-hungry, fame-seeking, uh, you know, dream chasers. Yeah. Um, referencing uh, Poison and Malanoche, those early films, do you think there was a sort of uh, a gutsier take on filmmakers' parts within the queer community at that time that they could make queer films that represented any kind or had any kind of character in it, whereas, like, 25, 30 years later, we're sort of obsessed with making sure that communities are very positively represented? Oh, totally, yeah. But, I mean, I, I still feel like, you know, filmmakers are still, you know, queer filmmakers are taking chances today for sure. But, uh, but yeah, around that time, uh, you know, early 90s, I think there was a little bit, it, it was a bit more about kind of celebrating why gay people are different and embracing that rather than trying to, you know, assimilate into heteronormative culture, as someone might say. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but, 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 you know, with the last 20 years of a lot of, uh, you know, very positive portrayals of gay characters, I think we're at a place where we can tell other kinds of stories as well without fearing, uh, you know, being perceived as bad. The film does a really great job of telling a story about murder within the a, a gay porn world, not the gay porn world, but a gay porn world, without demonizing that world. I mean, in the sense that Brent Corrigan, the main character, has a certain amount of agency over, over what he's doing, even though he's underage when it initially starts. Was that something that was important for you in telling this story, that it didn't come across as a sort of uh, demonization of, uh, of that world? Yeah, definitely. 
Yeah, but really wanted to portray, uh, you know, as with I and Michael, wanted to portray each character as just kind of be, um, you know, seek to understand rather than vilify them because they are people. So even if someone has a career that maybe you don't agree with, or, you know, in the case of maybe Christian's character, Stephen, people might think he's, uh, you know, sleazy or a bit of a predator, but he also is a human, and, you know, we all have our flaws. So I think it's, it's uh, important to try and understand um, you know, why people do what they do. And, you know, I have had friends work in gay porn who are, like, really great, awesome people who just like it. So it doesn't mean that they're these, uh, you know, filthy whores. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, even if, you, even if Christian's character is kind of a sleazy predator, what's sort of great is that you give this backdrop of someone who is closeted, who's sort of been pushed in, uh, into sort of his own fringe, where it's almost necessary for him to be a bit of a sleazy predator to sort of acquiesce his desires. He almost has no... Uh, no other option at that point. I mean, he has a slight option, but mm -hmm. he's sort of in this position where there really is nothing else for him. Yeah, no, no, that's where that line is in there where during the kind of, you know, video camera scene mm -hmm. between Stephen and Sean where, where Christian's character says, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of been repressed for so long, and at this point, I just don't care anymore. I'm going to be attracted to who I want to be, even if people think they're too young. I'm going to make gay porn if I want to, even if people think it's dirty. And, you know, it's this oddly kind of uplifting message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Christian, did you channel any directors that you've worked with on feature films for, for, your, char for your character when he was directing? Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> certainly, I, you know, I had all kinds of images in my head. Of course, Lars being one of them, I suppose. Um, but yeah, you know, just the frustration of dealing with, uh, you know, prima donnas, things like that. I, I channeled all of that. What's it like? What's it like working with Lars? It's sort of one of those things where if you come on the stage, I, I'm most likely going to ask you what it was like working with Lars von Trier. Uh, you know, for me, it was a fantastic experience. You know, he's um, very much like Justin. I mean, we we rolled the camera. There it is. Justin. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, you know, we we. There was a lot of freedom on the set. Uh, there was a lot of uh, improv. You know, he used a digital camera, so, you know, we were able to do very long takes and, uh, you know, didn't feel any pressure. There was just great organization, and he's certainly surrounded by a, a great team of people, and he's, uh, I found him to be just very genuine and sweet, and I think I was very fortunate in, in that film that the, the scenes that I had to do were, were very uh, sensitive and, and loving so that was nice for me he somewhat was, tame compared to the compared to the, the silent the, duck and yeah the majority movies. exactly yeah some of the other things that he's done uh justin are, are is there a fair amount of improvisation in this film do you sort of write a tight script and stick to it or are you more of an outline based uh director and sort of letting the tight actors script. run a little bit <laughs> tight script yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you were sharp yeah we didn't have a lot of time either right so so yeah no i thought yeah the script was yeah, but it was, it was you know, like very, um, very economical because yeah. low budget, not a lot of time. But definitely, you know, each scene really, you kind of get what the scene is about based on the dialogue. But I never, I don't need lines to be read exactly as they're written at all. Mm -hmm. So um, there were like, you know, there were quite a few lines in there where people just kind of had fun, uh, you know, and improv a bit for sure. You said that you were an assistant to Gus Van Sant. What have you taken from him or what do you think you learned from him when you started making your own films? Uh, yeah, I was an assistant to the editor on Sorry. Milk, but it was, a, it was a very small crew, so it was Gus, the editor, Elliot, um, and two assistants, and I, I was on it from start to finish. Is this for Milk? For Milk, yeah, yeah, yeah back in 2008. Uh, and yeah, I think, I mean, I learned a lot about, um, you know, mostly about the editing process, which is one of the most important things for a director to learn about. It really, uh, you know, you kind of want to get enough material on set, but not too much, especially when you're, you have limitations in terms of budget and time. Um, yeah, so I feel like I really learned how to kind of, you know, be, economical as a director and, uh, you know, make sure to get really great material um, that will, you know, cut together well and make for a great film. Mm -hmm. yeah. Christian, uh, you said that you're sort of fascinated by or want to do what challenges you at this point or what sort of draws some sort of fear out of you or makes you, challenges you. What do you think the most challenging film that you've done over the course of your career has been? Huh. Um, wow. Well, uh, I mean, the there was one I did a long time ago, which I loved, um, uh, but I guess sort of set the template for the kind of effort and uh, uh, that I, that I want to put into my work. But it was, it was a long time ago. I mean, Pump Up the Volume. I played a Great radio, movie. radio DJ. Oh, right. right. Uh, thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean that that 
was great, and I, I loved the character, and, and uh, I was... A Lenny Bruce-like radio DJ, well, yeah. one who references Lenny Bruce consistently, but that, also, that right. film was also filled with extensive, page-long monologues. monologues and, yeah, and I, I was given extensive time to uh, rehearse and, and improvise, and, and uh, so we handled it very much like a, a stage, you know, theatrical kind of experience, which was good because I, I had just come from doing theater in New York, and... Uh, so all those things kind of synced up, and uh, and I got along very well with the director. I mean, oh, it was sorry, filmed. Man. It was filmed in my hometown. Oh my, yeah, really? that's yeah. incredible. Yeah, <laughs> full circle. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I want to I want to stick to the movie, but since Christian, you're here, I have two other questions about okay. your, your your career over the course of time. One, they're making a Heather's TV show. I'm yeah. sure everybody on the circuit that you guys have been on has asked you this question, but yeah. for the sake of our audience, I'll ask you as well. What do you? I'm know playing the high school you? principal. There, are you really? No, I'm oh. not. I mean, Oh. I could I could see that. Wouldn't that be something? I know. What a, what a scoop that would be. Yeah. You heard it here. Guys. Yeah, you heard it here first. Uh, what what do you what do you what do you know about it? Are you excited to see how they? I am excited. It? I mean, I think they've, uh, from what I understand, they found like an interesting new way to kind of update it and uh, put a new sort of twist on it. Um, it's fascinating because when I think of Heather's, I think of like this wonderful cult movie that there's no way in fucking hell yeah. you could make that now. I know. I know. Yeah, that's how I felt about, you know, I went and saw the musical, and I uh, was certainly charmed by that here, but uh, I'll be honest with you, you know, I mean, I am an actor, and it's really freaking hard to sit there in the theater and watch somebody else say those lines. It's just, it's agony. <laughs> it's, it's agony. Uh, and my other one is uh, a personal favorite of mine, and maybe not of yours, and I'm sorry if it's not his cuffs. Okay, yeah, no, I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? To each his own. <laughs> Yeah. What what do you think when you think back on that on that project? Hmm. Well, um, look, that was uh, another very special time, and certainly uh, I think Tony Goldwyn and Mila Jovovich and, uh, and Bruce uh, Bruce Evans and Ray Gideon they they had written Starman, you know that movie with Jeff uh, Jeff Bridges. I don't know if anybody saw it. Starman, but come yeah. on, that was a incredible movie. So I was really excited to work with those guys, and uh, yeah, you know I I had uh, I had a lot of fun on that. All right, there it is. Uh, let's open it up to the audience for some questions. Oh, wow. Who's got questions out here? Hey, guys. Uh, hey. I actually got to see the movie at uh, Tribeca a few months ago. Okay. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I was just wondering, like, what were the challenges you guys faced, like, trying to stay true to uh, these guys, like, since they're based off of real people, and, like, what liberties you guys had to take? Oh, good question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I, f I feel like what's come up a lot is... Uh, when you have a film based on real people, if it's someone who's very known, like a Milk or a JFK or a Malcolm X or something, then it's you know important to, to get every sort of mannerism mm -hmm. down. But for people who are, are lesser known in a film like this, uh, I think it's better for an actor to kind of create a character based on the real person. Uh, you know, obviously we have people who you know somewhat resemble the real people, but they kind of uh, make it their own. So um, there weren't too many challenges in bringing the characters to life. Um, I think the challenges would have just been a boring, boring production talk. <laughs> what was your production schedule on this? Uh, it was pretty intense. We shot in 18 days. 18 days is crazy. It's insane. Especially yeah. for something like this. Yeah. Did you find that you were paring down locations and stuff like that going into it? Did you have to change your script at all to sort of match 18 locations? Uh, we changed. 18 days, excuse me. Yeah, changed a few things, but uh, but you, you get kind of crafty. You know, we you, we would do something like find a restaurant where the back patio is the brunch spot and the inside is the dinner spot because they look totally restaurant. different. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Boyston's. Uh huh. Um, yeah, you know, you just kind of like find creative ways to make it work. But I feel like, as with a lot of art, these limitations kind of uh, they end up you know making very like interesting story or character choices that you wouldn't have made had you not been forced to. Uh, you know, to kind of adhere to such a tight schedule. Mm -hmm. So even though it was rough, sometimes I think, you know, like the, there's a very long one -er in a in a, the Japanese restaurant with right. um, when James Franco meets. I love that meets, shot. That, 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 great that shot. It's so great. And when you choose. And on that kind of schedule, it does force you to use your brain in a different sort of way. you got to find creative solutions. to Exactly. Well, it's also, yeah. it's the first time that you kind of hold for that long in the movie. I mean, not just for that long, but really hold on, uh, on a shot. And it sets up that scene beautifully. Yeah, yeah, that, that scene was initially uh, totally different. It was like probably, you know, six points of coverage or something, and we were so pressed for time that we, you know, kind of had to make it a one -er, and it worked out great because it kind of falls, you know, somewhat near the middle of the film, and so it's a great moment for a break. It's pivotal. Yeah, because yeah, well, you just kind absolutely. of, you know, there's so yeah. much action and 
so many sweaty men, you know, you just need a little break. That's where it comes down to also like the chemistry of the actors and uh, I mean, they, their, their work in that scene I just thought was remarkable. Yeah. yeah, James and Keegan are very, very funny in the movie. They're yeah. heartbreakingly funny at yeah. times. Um, next question. Uh, I also recommend Nymphomaniac. Oh. Um, <laughs> I have a question for both of you. Um, first, uh, Mr. Kelly, how did you balance the tone of the film throughout the process of filming and are there any films that influenced you on how to balance the tone? And Mr. Slater, are there any living filmmakers that you would jump at a chance to work with? Mm, great questions. All right. All right. Yeah, I've had a lot of influence for this. I mean, uh, the main one, which probably seems very predictable, is Boogie Nights. But it's such a great film, and I always loved the way uh, that they kind of you know, balanced the, the camp with drama, the way that characters would just say something so ridiculous, but you kind of believe they would say it. And you know, I don't know if people will believe that for Cobra, but some of the things that even Joe and Harlow say, you know, Harlow kind of bragging about his jacket being diesel, and there are things that I really do think those characters would say, they just seem funny to us. Right. Um, <laughs> so Boogie Nights, a Star 80 is one that kind of came yeah. up a lot. I definitely got a Star 80 vibe from, from Franco kind of going Eric Roberts, Star 80. Yes. Bit. Yes, totally. Yeah. <laughs> for me, it definitely. was uh, Gypsy. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just yeah. had like Ethel Merman in, the, in my head all the time, and uh, uh, yeah, I was just thinking that whole story of you know being Mama Rose, and this is my Gypsy Rose Lee, and uh, you know we were gonna go all the way. <laughs> and is there uh, to answer his other question? Is there a living filmmaker that you want to work with? The guy that's been popping into my head a lot, uh, well, for a long time, is uh, Matthew Vaughn. I, he's just somebody that I really would love to work with. I, I think he's got always does uh, has a unique take on material and. Um, uh, just all of his stuff. Layer Cake, I thought was a very cool movie. And Did Vaughn do The Kingsman? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the most underrated yeah. box, like hot, like studio movie of the year that it came out. So, so much too. fun. Yeah, it was fun. I, so I subversive, transgressive, and over the top and crazy. It was, it was twisted. I, I like his, his sensibilities, and he certainly has a dark humor that I, I respond to as well. Absolutely. Uh, next question. I think we have time for one more question. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering how... Uh, Molly Ringwald and um, Chris, uh, Lisa Silverstone got uh, involved with it for like since they're not really known for doing these type of uh, mm -hmm. movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think that's why they did it. Um, you know, similar reason that, that almost everyone who is, is in the film, they've all kind of said uh, it's wild and fun and something different outside of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I definitely you know, with with everyone, even Christian, I kind of thought, oh, I wonder if people are gonna just freak out when they read this or because <laughs> the script was you know as explicit as some of the sex scenes are or kind of some of the salacious moments and uh, they just responded to it and you know said yes and they're they're awesome yeah. and they'd work with had they worked with james before is that right or they work with the uh, franco's manager so, okay yeah yeah it's actually james and um his manager suggested it and i thought well yeah that'd be a dream uh if they would want to and i got very lucky that they said yes when Molly Ringwald is on your set, do you have to take a couple minutes to sort of get the Breakfast Club and everything out of your head when you look at her? Like, I don't. I think I would need like two minutes of being like, <sighs> yeah. Okay, I'm good. I'm good now. No, she's certainly an icon, and and uh, yeah, absolutely. She's uh, she was great and and wonderful to work with. I, I really loved it. She did an amazing job. Yeah. Guys, uh, the movie is hilarious and brutal, and and it's really great. Congratulations. How can people see it? It opens this Friday, the 21st, in New York, and on demand, VOD, iTunes, and then the following week, the 28th, in LA, and about 12 other cities. All right. Congratulations, guys. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you.